Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is I Dodge Live. It's Thursday, which means it must be Conversations with Thomas on I Dodge Live, the place where classical music happens. You know how much I love that motto. It's great. Tonight, what can I say? This is a happening show. First of all, my surroundings have changed, which you might have noticed. So I told you, I promised you last week, I'd tell you, I'm actually in Florence. And of all things, and the reason I'm telling you this is not because my travelogue is particularly interesting, but because I'm actually rehearsing again in an opera house for a production. And I cannot tell you how exhausted I am and how good that feels. So I'm in Florence. I also have a co-host with me this evening. This is Pinu. Pinu, say hello. Hello. Now, Pinu sits here. Pinu's with me all the time now in Florence. So we have a co-host. So enough nonsense. We have a fantastic show tonight, a conversation with a guy I know, like, I'm not sure as, as well as you watching the show know, but, you know, his name, his performances, his legend, his awards. I mean, what can I say? David Garrett, good evening. Wonderful to good meet you. Good evening. Pleasure meeting you too over Zoom. And also good evening to everybody or good morning or whatever time exactly. it is around the world. <laughs> where, wherever you are. Where, where have I caught you? Where are you? I am actually on a, a big boat right now, but I'm not traveling on the sea. I'm next to the harbor. And I can it's see. for a, a small TV production we are about to do tomorrow. So I get to also make some music in the circumstances what is possible these days. Oh, fantastic. Have you, have you, well, of course you had, like all of us, you've had your calendar pretty much wiped out or, or moved around. Absolutely, yeah. Is everything just moving forward like a big tsunami into the future? A little bit, of course. I mean, in the end, we were planning to go on tour uh, last year and, and this year worldwide. And what can you do besides being very hopeful? I mean, it's, it's a very difficult situation for many people out there. That's awesome. um, but if people have bought a ticket, of course, you, you try to, to let them know that the, the moment everything is possible again, um, we will perform there. And I'm looking forward to finally performing there. But in the end, um, we, we, we are actually moving a lot of things, of course, forward yeah. with, with, the, with being very hopeful that things are going to work out very soon. But it sounds like in your world, especially since you bridge so successfully classical yeah. and, and the pop medium, that, yeah. that when, when tours of pop projects fall apart, yeah. they just go away. That's just, that's it. Well, um, Pretty hard to book I, a tour. I, I, I like to basically, you know, every tour for me has, has a big importance because even if I go on with crossover, it kind of opens a door for the next tour, which is classical. You know, right. for, for a lot of people who have actually seen me perform crossover they actually also went to see me play beethoven or a bach solo evening and right. so for me every tour is is a step to to uh, an, another step so um you know in the end of course i think a lot of musicians miss performing right now luckily we do have the arts even right. if i just play at home and play for myself or play for my mother uh, or for my sister, it's still a sense of performing for somebody, which I, of course, take advantage of uh, probably more than my mother wants to. Has, has, this time, uh, has this time been a rest in some ways? Yes. In one has some to be ways, one, no? it, it, it is actually a little bit of a forced sabbatical. As, I, I, I called it my COVID sabbatical last spring yeah. sometime. <laughs> and please, ladies and gentlemen, don't get me wrong. We're not chuckling or laughing about the hard no. times that we're still in. No. This is a yeah. horrible, <clears throat> horrible time. Yeah. But uh, we artists have had our, our the rug taken out from underneath our feet. Yeah. And somehow we must turn it into a positive development. Yeah. And that's all uh, I'm really I, 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 I see it exactly uh, as you said. You know, if, if you lose positivity, you know, where you lose hope and, and, and we, we go down a, a terrible yeah. path. Um, yes, it, it has been uh, <coughs> definitely a kind of sabbatical, yet a lot of doors which I would have n never maybe taken uh, or used uh, suddenly opened. You know, I, I started working on, um, on different projects, uh, which I honestly would never have had the time to do yeah. uh, in, in a normal uh, performance here. So, 
I try to keep myself busy. Um, just about to hit the studio for a, a core classical uh, recording with the Deutsche Grammophon. So um, that's something I'm super excited about. And uh, there's a book project which I'm uh, uh, keeping fingers crossed. Uh, I get to write. So that's another exciting project and, and many other things in the pipeline, which for 100% certainty, I would have never had the, the time and the chance to kind of go uh, with these projects. So a lot of my singing colleagues have confessed yeah. that when the calendar fell apart, yeah. they didn't sing. And then when something came up with the head, it was like, oh, uh, 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 you know, I have to get myself back together. Did you did you just put the fiddle down and say, oh, the heck with it for or have you just been <laughs> sorry, pardon the phrase fiddling around? <laughs> no, no. Basically, that thing is always with me. And, you know, I have a, a pretty strict regimen. Um, it's every day, uh, two to three hours, depending uh -huh. on my, my, my mood, of course. But two hours is a minimum. And that's the time I need uh, to keep in shape. So if somebody calls tomorrow to play something, a big concerto or a recital, I'm ready. And um, I kind of start getting afraid when I don't play for a number of days. Yeah. Because I, I do know, as every artist knows, the amount of days you don't practice, you kind of also need to get yourself back into yeah. that, that comfort zone. Maybe... Honestly, two, three days is not a bad thing. Sometimes you're even more inspired with the music and it, the, everything breathes more. But I think after four days, it becomes a little bit of a um, tougher way to kind of like, at, at least with the violin. I don't know yeah. how it is with the voice. But uh, physically, if you don't play for three, four days, you hear it. You don't only feel it, but I can hear it. Do you know what Horowitz said once when they asked him this? He said, well... If I don't practice for a day, I feel it. I hear it. If I don't practice for two days, my wife hears it. If I don't practice for three days, the whole world hears it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so. it's, very, it's very true, though. It's very, very true. So um, to get back to the, the question, I really do enjoy practicing, actually. So for me, keeping in shape or whatever you want to call it yeah. is actually something I do because I like doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about, this is also a kind of a unique uh, uh, interview, which is really fun. As you know, I've been interviewing and, and getting to know so many colleagues that I wouldn't normally have had a chance to meet so casually uh, through this series of interviews, which I thoroughly enjoy. And idadro.com, the wonderful streaming platform, and then we have idadro Live, which of course is this series. But of course, last, last uh, June, uh, we started the Global Concert Hall, which has been a huge success. And, and that's what we're doing today. Tonight. And this is actually a pre-show, pre-concert interview, if you will. I think the concert starts at 7.30, but it's going to stay online for a while, so you can come and go. If some of you have to drop off because you want to get the downbeat of the show, I get that completely. But we're going to keep going. You can always come back and hear the rest of it because all of the interviews stay online. But this is actually called, the show tonight is David Garrett Unlimited from Verona, which is streaming the Global Concert Hall tonight. Today, tonight, whatever your day is, Thursday, 25 February at 7.30 p.m. Central European Time, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in America. And don't let me go through all of that. I don't know what it is in Australia. But You're mind. doing it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it will be available to watch until Sunday, February 28, 2021, uh, 11 p.m. Central European Time. This is really uh, a really wonderful and exciting program. Um, I, and I'm sure I'm going to watch it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It was filmed, if I understand it, in the yeah. in the Arena di Verona. No? Can you tell us tell us about the program, David? Well, the program is um, mm -hmm. a little bit of, um, well, the last 10 years, I've made a lot of classical recordings, but I also have done my own projects, meaning um, I, I love arranging music I like listening to. That can be a piece by Metallica, that can be, be a piece by uh, Billie Holiday, that can be a piece by um, any musician uh, from the 20th century, popular musician, but it can also be a classical piece. So over the last 10 years, I've kind of established my kind of own repertoire um, a little bit in I, I guess somebody who's, who's done that in the past was maybe Fritz Kreisler who's who I'm a huge admirer of yeah. and so I discovered so bit by bit my own program 
And uh, Unlimited actually was the tour where we combined my favorite pieces from the last 10 years, mm. from the crossover, but also from the classical uh, part. So it's probably the most diverse program, but I think, and, and I always feel that when you're an instrumentalist, and I learned that from Itzhak Perlman, you do not have the words to, to entertain an, an audience. Of course, you can speak in between the pieces, but musically, you always have to have a very uh, intellectual journey. Meaning mm -hmm. if you play two, three fast pieces, people will get bored of the virtuosity. If you just play slow things, you know, people will start falling asleep after the third piece. I mean, depending how good you are, maybe not, but still you, you guess you or you know which direction I'm going with this. So for me, being able to play a Claire de Lune and then go to a Master of Puppets by Metallica and then playing a little bit of jazz and then right. a little bit of R&B and then going back into a piece by Beethoven. Mm -hmm. I think that is really quite a journey which uh, people, at least I totally get excited performing. And I think people in Verona also enjoyed it. Well, it's, it, it was a very popular program and I'm so glad they captured it and we can have it on, on the Global Concert Hall. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. a wonderful program. David, is there, let's, let's go backwards a little bit. I mean, yeah. I, 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 you know, I know you as a personality, I know you as a musician, but I only know a little bit of your life. Um, obviously raised in Germany, obviously by an intellectual and, and ballerina mother, uh, you know, raised as a musician from, from, a, from a small child. What part of your childhood do you think people don't know about that maybe is interesting? Well, maybe the things people do not know about are the ones I might want to really keep for myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Is there, is, there no, one, no. is there one you want to let slip out? Uh, let, let, let me think. I mean, anybody can guess. The violin is an instrument where you start practicing at a very, very early age. Yeah. I don't think there's any violinist who really had a career starting age uh, when, when if the if he started age 10 11 i think isaac stern started with eight that's pretty much the oldest somebody ever started to really become uh, a world famous violinist um that being said it is very draining it's a lot of work it's very frustrating i i see my nephews my nephew from a, a child from my brother just turned five and i see how impatient he is. He's a lovely kid, but he's super impatient. He plays with this thing, and then two seconds later, he's like, interesting there, interesting there. And I can only imagine, I mean, I don't necessarily remember me playing the violin, but I can only imagine that it must have been tough at that age to really practice an hour or a half an hour or 20 minutes even to be focused on something. So I think it is not an easy uh, instrument to really start with. So but, how did it start? Was it? Was I mean, your parents were encouraged uh, musically, and that's fine. But yes, clearly true. you must have just loved it when you when you started. It was like I want to do. <laughs> well, he, I, you know, I have a brother who's two years older. He's now a, a lawyer, so he he stopped. Oh, he has a real he this. has a real job. <laughs> he has a real job. Yes, and lucky him, he actually does have a job in the last year and a half. Um, but uh, you know, he he started actually uh, playing the violin. It was a little bit of a forced marriage with the violin because my dad wanted my brother to play the violin, and uh, so obviously I'm five years old. I don't know. My brother has a forced marriage. For me, my brother has a toy which I do not have. Of course, being the younger brother, I do want to have the same toy. So me actually asking for the violin was was a personal decision, which I I. 100% probably also, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, there were certainly times where I regretted that decision because it's it's ups and downs when you start learning the violin. But in, in the end, my brother was the one who really made me think of the instrument as something cool. Well, what, what were your friends like? Did you have other, I mean, as a, as a kid, where yeah. you... You know, I was playing baseball and doing yeah. completely asinine yeah. things as it, as it being what they call a normal child in America. But, but I mean, when you're spending that much time and you're so devoted to it and you want to do it, did you, yeah. did you share that with other friends? Were you in a music school early? Were there other people, you know, were the, were the other boys and girls yeah. playing violin in your class? What was that like? I, I was actually living kind of two lives. 
on the one hand, I, at that age, I was still going to normal elementary school. Right. But on the weekends, um, I was always traveling to teachers. And uh, to be quite honest, I wasn't a cool kid at elementary school. Not at all. Violin, hmm, kids can be mean. It's not the instrument where uh, the boys and the girls come over and are like, hey, uh, we'll, uh, show us the instrument who you play something for us. <laughs> so that, that I was I was kind of the nerd for a very, very long time, very long. And um, but of course, there was always that musical island uh, when my parents drove to uh, Lübeck at that point or to uh, Hilversum for different teachers. And in those classes, I was cool because I was actually getting quite quickly good at something. So for me, those were the islands where my self-esteem with the violin and I'm good at this. But school, uh, was was something totally different. So it was a little bit of a double life. In right. one life, I was eh, the nerd. In the other one, I was actually being appreciated for being a nerd. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Well, I mean, this double life thing, I mean, that, that <laughs> seems to be a, a, a theme because you are so amazingly versatile. You used, you used the word crossover, which I know is a word that yeah. we use in the classical department, and I certainly made a lot of class, class over, yeah. crossover records. But... Yeah. I must say, you know, sometimes I was a bit flippant and I said in an interview, I would say, I'm not sure which direction I'm crossing over from or okay. what crossover means. And, and yeah. what I find with you that is so remarkable, and it's somewhat similar to Renee Fleming, you know, I did work, I did songs that from, you know, current and poet or that sort of thing, which we considered yeah. classically trained artists and so forth. But you guys, but especially you, you have, you certainly, you just simply embrace other genres. and. Yeah. And there's no question when you play, you know, whatever, Billie Holiday or, or yeah. some other piece or some, yeah. as you say, crossover music, yeah. there's, there's maybe somebody who's never heard you and hears you play that. If somebody yeah. said, oh, well, you should get his Bach recording because it's just amazing, they'd probably look at me and say, what's a Bach or, or oh, that can't possibly be. Yeah. And, and perhaps the other way around. It, is that something that comes naturally or is that something you cultivate or you've worked on? Um, it comes very natural. You, it, you play the music you play. I. Let's quote another great uh, composer and musician, uh, Leonard Bernstein. I mean, he said there's other great music or there's bad music. And uh -huh. let's face it, there's also classical music is always put on that pedestal. But let's face it, there's so much bad classical music, which <laughs> is forgotten. So there's not only yeah. great, amazing classical, there are great pieces and wonderful repertoire uh, everywhere. But um, for me, uh, a song needs to be... Um, connect to my heart. It needs to be emotional. It needs to have a wonderful harmonic progression. It needs to have a great melody, which gives something to me. And, and that is found everywhere, even the most simplest melody. And let's, let's face it, even Mozart and Beethoven, they made very simple, simple pieces for the piano here and there. And mm. they're so beautifully. So of course, when people say, you know, pop music isn't that complex, like a ninth Beethoven symphony, that is absolutely true. But I think the quint quint essence of of a great piece is a wonderful harmonic progression and a great melody, and that can be thirty seconds long or thirty minutes long. Right. It's still so hard to create that. Well said. Um, back to your biography, Yehudi Menuhin. Yeah. Were you close? Did you study with him a long time? I did. He was yeah. very. I think anybody who met him, anybody who had the privilege and, and pleasure to to work with him uh can can testify he was such an amazing humble human being and he was drawn to talent and i think uh, when we first met I, uh, I i of course the hero you know i was almost shaky i was nine years old but menuhin was like my my the icon i listened to all the recordings and you know the the, the and so so i was so nervous, but the moment I walked into, it was a hotel room, the moment I walked into my parents with the hotel room, he came over and he gave me a hug. He said, hey, nice to meet you. And everything was normal. I felt so comfortable. And then we, we actually, and I ended up playing like almost like an hour and a half. I was supposed to just be there for 10 minutes. And, and, and it felt like 10 minutes, but when I went out, my parents were like, listen, this was so incredible. He's listened to you for an hour and a half and worked. So uh, he, he was a huge inspiration, is still a huge inspiration, especially being able to work within the Elgar concerto. And he took a lot, a lot of time 
uh, working the Alga with me uh, until we actually did perform it uh, in, in Vienna at the Musikverein Saal. Wow. Um, and that was, of course, the direct link to Elga himself because he did the recording with Elga conducting it. So for me, that was probably one of the most moving experiences and, and amazing experiences, which until today, I don't remember much from my childhood. But that concert, I remember every note and I remember seeing him conduct it. And how, that's something which is... How old were you? I was 15 years old. Wow. Do you still play the Elgar? Yes, of course. It's one of my favorite uh, concertos in my repertoire. It's, it's a difficult one, but it is, yeah. it's full of noblesse and, and nobility. And that's what yeah. I love about it. What? How, I mean, what is your what is your what is your proportion? I mean, is every season full of crossover projects or other genre projects as well as core classical repertoire? I usually have like three, four months when I tour with one program, and then I tour for a month, two months with something else. Um, if we look back into the, the obviously before COVID nineteen, right? Um, I, I usually had two or three programs. One recital program, me and piano, you know, just doing sonatas and maybe some uh, virtuosic small pieces. Then I did uh, each season one violin concerto or two violin concerto the same night. And then there was always also the, the crossover project, whatever it was. It was sometimes film music, sometimes it was more into the rock um, music direction. But I really felt, we talked about the, the word crossover. You know, for me, crossover, yes, you're going somewhere literally on, on musical holiday because it's mm. something you're not 100% familiar with. Mm. But I always felt if you're crossing over somewhere, you still need to know where your home is. So for me, crossing over doesn't mean you have to leave your home, you know, behind and never return. Well, you, the, the, home, the home is where your heart is and where, where, where you get your skills and, and where you get your, your inspirations for, for going on holiday occasionally. Right. So for me, it was so important, so important to always, if I do a rock record, for me, the next thing is doing the Brahms concerto with Israel Philharmonic and Zubin. And being able to do that kind of, in Germany, they say spagat, you know, right. to that split. Yeah. I think that's something which I am super happy in my life that I'm able to do that. And people are, um, you know, supporting me. Right. Not, not everybody, you know, you can't make everybody love you. But a lot of people do, and I'm very thankful and grateful for that. Well, I think, um, <laughs> I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, pardon me if I just read a few statistics here, but we are talking about a, a, a violinist that has sold over 3 million albums, so I think there's a lot of people supporting you. You have 24 <laughs> gold and 16 platinum awards. You've got three pop <laughs> echoes and five classic echoes. Uh, I think you're the only the only echo guy who who is who has you know done that so demonstrably in 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 both areas. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's it a is. few people, there's a few people supporting. So tell me, did did when you but Yehudi probably never experienced that side of you. No, I mean he he helped me also create that side because this side would never exist if I would not have become a good classical musician. Right. For me. Yes, I started experimenting with music also during uh, my time at Juilliard. Yeah. But everything I do, phrasing, vibrato, taste, you know, this is something you learn when you study music, when you study arts, when you study history. And this is something you, yes, you have an instinct for when you're very small. It's good to have that, that instinct I actually call talent when you're a kid because you naturally get how music should be. But at right. some point when you're 13, 14, your brain, needs to take over an instinct you should kind of put apart and question your own instinct because only if you question your instinct you will actually find the good instinct and also the bad instinct because you, not everything you do naturally is right at least you have to question it and for me crossover everything is built on my ability to have good taste when i play something and bach is played you know that more than anybody is sung differently and Mozart is sung differently and Brahms and right. Alban Berg, you know, they all, you have to find the right sound, the right um, spirit, the right vibe, the right vibrato, the right energy. And it's pretty much the same going also a little further with going into jazz or into pop. And um, 
basically, even Menuhin, even working with him, prepared me to become good on the fiddle, good on the violin, becoming tasteful with what I do. Because I, it's for me the most important thing. Whatever you do, you need to do it tastefully. And because of that, I hope that whatever I do, I have that standard. And that's the most important thing in my life. When you were Juilliard, is that when you worked with Itzhak Perlman as well? Yes, yes. Right. I, and, I was, did, yeah. and did you have these kinds of, of fantasy repertoire conversations with him? By the way, throw in there some... Uh, did, did, has avant-garde music ever been on your palette? Yes, he, here and there. For, for yeah. me, I think every musician needs to find something where they're, you know, of course, comfort zone, but also something they feel not comfortable because how are you going to grow if you always do the things you're comfortably uh, with? Um, but here's a little fun fact. It's like Paulman, when I do play in New York, he actually comes with his wife, Toby, to the, the venue. And even if I play crossover, he sits there, you know, in one of the first rows and uh, he actually enjoys it. He's, what I love about me, Itzhak, he's told me Itzhak, so. Itzhak's idea of crossover is 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 singing. <laughs> he is well, I, I mean, I've I've heard him sing like the jailer in Fidelio or whatever that play was. <laughs> some concert. I mean, you know, I'm you know, it's, he's got some good chops. It's there. Yeah, it's, but, apparently, but you know, his class, apparently, in his class, he makes all of his all of his students. There's this wonderful thing out on on thing on Long, on Long Island Institute, and and all of his all of his violin students have to sing. They sing together. Oh, absolutely. Not only that, but I think he got that idea a little bit. I mean, I think any musician who plays an instrument knows that the most natural God-given talent is having a voice. And I remember we're also working with Isaac when I was 14, 15 in Verbier. And, you know, he said, listen, we all try to recreate the human voice on an instrument. So don't listen to other violinists. Stop listening to Heifetz. He's great. Stop listening to Arthur Grimio, Mielstein. They all, you, you will go back and listen to them. But now is the time to find your own voice. Listen right. to singers. Listen to Schubert Lieder. Listen to Schumann. Listen to the things where you have to learn phrasing. Because in the end, music is not about playing Flight of the Bumblebee very fast. I can do that. Great. But <laughs> music, I, I know it's, it's, it's kind of really oh, not yes, going to sound so good. Close. But in the end, I remember playing also for the Elga concerto, let's, we, we just talked about it, for Menuhin. And I remember him sitting there and he was si singing the second team, this da 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 And this is how you and try, you, you hear that, and that's how you try to... Question again. In the end, you try to recreate a phrasing, and the best right. way, and that's what Isaac and Itzhak and every great violinist told me, is the best way to find your own voice is sing it out loud. But I don't have a great voice, but try to sing it in your head how you would phrase something and basically that's that's for me the most important thing when it comes to playing the violin make it sound naturally make find your own voice find your own phrasing find your own textures your own colors and uh, normally it's all up here but you need to get it down here it, it I, I could go way down this rabbit hole with you because actually being a vocal pedagogue as well I very often use the metaphor of a, of a violin for for voice phrasing, you know, keeping keeping the string, keeping the bow on the string, keeping the vibration constant, keeping yeah. the the equal the pressure and so on. It's, it's an interesting, similar. We we have another conversation about this. All of this movement and musicality. Did your did your mother as a as a prima ballerina have influence on this? Did you do yoga and body movement as a kid, and and was that all? Here's a, a little fun story, which no. I will share for the first time from my childhood, which probably I did not tell. You were asking before. My mom, great ballerina, and she actually did take me, I think when I was three or four years old, to uh, 
you know, she was still doing ba ballet classes and, and doing all the exercises. And so she took me actually to one of the ballet classes and I had to put like those tights on. And uh, yeah. that I remember. <laughs> and let, let me say, um, it was the, the first and last time that I did it. <laughs> because, I mean, I love ballet. I love watching it. But in the end, uh, I think the, the program is starting right now huh? <laughs> in the background. So, but that's something I... I'm getting I some feedback here. Let, let me... Oh, uh, have you got it on? I know. No, I it me. was on me for some, for some reason. Was it you? I did. No, no me, I'm I don't know why I got it. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go there and just have a quick look. But anyway, finish your story. So you're in the no, leotards. This, what happened? So basically, I I knew I was not going to be a classical dancer and, and call it instinct or whatever. But there was a moment where my mom was like, well, you know, I, I love you very much, but those movements are not looking anywhere close to what you're supposed to do. So then uh, I guess I'm pretty, you know, it's my luck or bad luck. I don't know how to see it. <laughs> Well, I'll match you. I'll match you a story. That probably no one knows this about me, but, but in terms of in terms of dance and music and so forth, some, I'm, I am completely passionate whenever I can or whatever comes across my radar to watch international ice skating competitions, either singular oh. or duos. This yeah. movement on the ice, and especially when it's really interesting mu music, and you know, some of the high level competitions, you get some Shostakovich and you get some modern things. And you so, you know, I I absolutely I just I just love watching this and how it works, and of course it's amazing what they do. But it's the it's the flow that interests me so much. Yeah, I mean it's uh, to be quite. I was actually quite. I, um, uh, I was actually working with uh, Yevgeny Pushenko actually at some point on uh, it was an event called like I think um, dances on ice or something like that, and yeah, yeah. I was for fortunate to play some classical music while he was doing his turns and stuff. And I watched him during rehearsal. I mean, this is artistry yeah. meets athleticism. I was, in, it was so, so fascinating. It's amazing okay. what those people do. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a little, like I always like to do, we're going to do a little screen sharing here. And I see I pushed all the right buttons in there, Safari. So the next thing you should see is the Idajo splash page with the Global Concert Hall, David Garrett Unlimited, which has now started. So uh, who, 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 those of you who are still with us, we love you. And, and we know you're going to go over there and watch anyway. This is what it looks like. It's going to be a fantastic piece. We can just here, we'll just give a couple of minutes of teaser. <laughs> that was backstage. <laughs> I don't know if they can hear the music. <laughs> Yeah, they they can, and I'm I don't get to play very much of it because they, okay. we get all sorts of okay. But, but but and but anyway, this is this is you know Idanjo, and if you want to come here and and you can put in David's name here, and you can see his amazing discography. But I'll let you play with all of that. I'm going to come back out here. You know, David, the thing is, you know, I suppose everybody would look at something like that and say, "My God, you know, what's it like to be in front of those people and everything?" But what I love about those pictures is it look at people's faces. Look at those eyes. Look at that yeah. expectation. Look at that joy of listening. Of course, we miss that in the COVID time. But just in in general, yeah. this is what I can tell. I don't I don't know you personally, but I can yeah. tell that this is what feeds your imagination. It's it's opening people's hearts and minds. Yes, yes, yes. I do have to say though, if I walk on stage, um, for me the most important thing in my head whatever program i i play is i want to do a, a good decent job with the music right I, if there's an orchestra or a piano player or a band on stage the first and foremost important thing is i want to be happy after that show i want to be focused yes of course i i see the people but my priority is always with Excellent. me and i think the moment you lose that priority and try to play too much to the audience it's never a great show. I think people in the audience realize when you try to please them. Intimacy on stage, that view that an audience gets of an artist 
being in his element. That is what makes fascination for an audience, not somebody who's, you know, of course there are moments when I play to the, the audience because they need to be there, but that's not what, what I truly do inside. In the, in the end, even if I go like this, I know musically it's important and I do it for myself and I do it for the music. And it's funnily I, enough- it was Maybe, the, maybe play, the question was actually clumsy from my side. Yeah. No, no. I, no sorry, I've got a bit of a leg. No, my, yeah. the, the question was clumsy from my side. I didn't mean that you go out to play to those thousands of people, but, yeah. but you have this enormous following and, and people believe in you and about yeah. you yeah. for exactly the reasons you just said. And I certainly hope a lot of my voice decent students just listen to you say this. Now, look, what we're going to do, and because I, I don't want to, we, we actually sent out and asked anybody who wanted to send in some questions to send them in, and we got Great. only only about 87, five, 87 of them. I don't know. I don't. So I thought what we'd do is just I'm gonna just randomly go through this. So Danya has said, "I attended 14 of your concert. What is the song you played that you are most fond of between classical?" and pop music that is somewhat a typical question we all get uh, i have a whole time answering what, what do you have can you answer that question yes the bach chacon oh okay i think to be quite honest it's the most brilliant piece ever written for violin so there it is a question from andrea does the sound of a violin get worse if you don't play it for a longer time <laughs> um <laughs> depends i mean you can overplay or over sing or overwork anything um meaning that i think it's important to there, there there needs to be a period where an instrument is being played but there also needs to be a period where the instrument can rest right. for instance i do have two violins you know i have a beautiful stradivari but i also have a working fiddle and that's this one the strat is not i'm not always worthy also to play the strat in the morning, I do my scales on my working fiddle, which is also not a bad one. I do my scales, I do my arpeggios, I do the attitudes. And if I feel it's a good day, I go pick up the strap. Because I think no matter what position you are in life, you need to earn the good things. I need to earn my violin. Wow, I love that. All right, Christina, this is a little bit off the wall. How do you imagine your life as a retired person? What has been the weirdest rumor you heard about you? Um, I, I don't listen to rumors at all. I, Good. And, and even if I, if I hear something, I forget it because it's so far away from the, the truth that it doesn't really, um, it's not, nothing I can remember properly. But... Uh, how would I see myself as a retired person? Is that the question at some point in my life? Or I've just thrown you the questions, and, and quite okay. frankly, you don't want to answer this. Somebody also said they saw you on Instagram cooking vegan chili. Was yeah. that occasional, or are you in the vegan lifestyle? I actually pescatarian. I I stopped eating uh, red meat and also white meat. So for me, I, I still eat occasionally fish, but I feel more energetic without red meat. Don't ask me why. It's it's anybody's personal choice. I I feel like I I have more energy. I also stopped drinking milk actually. So, for, for there's a couple of things, you know. Everybody, you. every's body, every everybody's body is different. I I need to find the thing which works for me. But I'm I'm not against people eating meat. I'm not like don't eat meat. It's just not working for me. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth asked, what was your audition repertoire for your Juilliard audition? Was there anyone else on the violin faculty you wanted to or worked with? You want to hear something really funny? Yes. At the Juilliard application form, there is, you know, they, they says teacher's choice number one, teacher's choice number two, and teacher's choice number three. <laughs> and guess what I did? I said, teacher's choice number one, it's a chroma. Teacher's choice number two, it's a chroma. Teacher's choice number three, it's a chroma. I, I, you, you get that I really did want to study with him. <laughs> so, <laughs> and regarding repertoire, obviously, then you need to do one 20th century, 20th century piece. So I chose a second uh, violin concerto by Shostak. Oh, it was Bartok, second Bartok violin concerto. And there's a whole list. You need to have some Baroque piece, one solo piece, two Paganini caprices. 
I think I did 24 and number one in my audition. And um, a, a little another fun fact from that audition is that I it was snowstorm in New York and my parents actually did not know that I was going to audition for Juilliard school. And uh, so I basically told my parents, I'm going to visit my brother in Boston who was studying at Harvard at that point. So I took the Chinatown bus from Boston over um, to New York, took a taxi up to Lincoln Center, did my audition. Um, I thought I did pretty well. Um, you, you have to imagine my English was really not good at that point. So I thought I did a very good audition. And at some point, there is the recall sheet. Now, my English is not good. For me, recall means they're not sure you did a good job. You need to play again to prove that you actually did not that bad. Yeah. So I look at that thing and I see my name and I just go like, oh, you know, the word. Ah, damn it. I messed it up. And then somebody like saw that I looked very disappointed. He's like, hey, you made it. And I, I'm like, what do you mean? So basically, I thought I really messed up the whole audition. But in the end, I ended up you know, studying with Itzhak for four years and probably the the best musical four years of my life because, you know, when you when you live in New York and you you, you work and live around Lincoln Center, all the ballets and the opera and, 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 and Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, Juliet uh, students get like reduced prices to Carnegie Hall, sometimes free tickets if you show up just right before seven o'clock. You go to the Juilliard office and they always have some spare tickets for Carnegie. I mean, I must have seen maybe 150, at least 150 50 concerts, opera productions, Avery Fisher Hall, everything, jazz stuff also downtown, the Blue Note, I love to go. So oh, for me, this no, was no. just oh. like, oh. just just soaking, soaking in anything. And so, see, so that was a wonderful see, experience. You know, God rest him, he just passed, uh, Chick yeah. Corea. I, yeah. I, Two or three of his concerts at Balloon. I actually met him. There was a, I, there was a conversation about a concert that I might be in with him, and somebody, you know, he would do something. I mean, it never happened, and I was so intimidated. But, but what an incredible music! But the Blue Note, my God, what a place! Uh, ah. I've, I've, I've seen my. I mean, I. Funny, there was one incident where a friend of mine was performing, and Sting was in the audience, and yeah. then at some point it was just a jazz pianist. So at some point, Sting goes like to the stage, says, "Do you mind doing a couple of things with me?" I mean, stuff like this out of the freaking blue and really oh, out of the blue, wow. not not the, the things where it's planned before. But, you know, the, these things kind of like made me really want to become a musician, but also find the thing where I can where my eyes light up and, and I get excited. And, and, I, and, and I mean, it's if you are a musician and you love music, it's the most beautiful job in the world. Bottom line. And even now we can't really perform, but. You know, it will happen eventually again, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to playing again for myself, but of course also for everybody who's going to you know, show up. You have an eight-year-old fan, Søren, who would like to ask you, do you ride a motorbike? No. I, I, bicycle, yes, but not even in the city. I have to take the bike out to some, you know, outside of the city. I am a little scared of my hands. You know, I, it's 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 my living, and I think if I would break a finger, I would be not forgiving myself for being that stupid to let that happen. And yeah. you know, of course, you know, accidents can happen, and sometimes they're not your fault. That's karma, or you know, with destiny, and, and things sometimes happen that are not good. But me taking an, a certain risk, and I think driving a motorcycle or motorbike, that would be too risky for me. Certain things I would just not do. Although I love motorcycles. You know, apropos, uh, I know this is completely off subject and forgive me, but being a passionate golfer, uh, my my stomach sank, my heart sank. But Tiger Woods has had a very serious automobile accident yeah. two days ago uh, with catastrophically uh, um, injuries, to, injuries to his right or lower leg, which will certainly impact his golf as well as the golf world but i mean i, I, I what i want to just say is <laughs> if anybody else loves golf like i do yeah. our hearts are with him and his family and but especially with him Absolutely. I mean, whatever whatever rehab he was going through for his back just just became 
a year of unbelievable agony just to be able to walk again. I imagine that's what the doctors are saying. Okay, I got another question for you. I got another yes. a technical question. If Evgenia says, I remember you in testing different incredible viol violins in Cremona. Yeah. Personally, I can't forget the deep, dark kind of velvet of the Guarnieri sound. I know it would be difficult, but are you able to explain why and what specifically at the end made you choose the Stradivarius violin? This is a wonderful I, 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 This is a good question. Um, I, I don't remember choosing a Stradivari. Here's the thing, Guarneri is something very interesting for violinists. And if you look into the history of um, violinists, probably more have chosen a Guarneri del Gesù over a Strad. Menuhin, in the end, did the, uh, you know, changed from even the, one of the greatest Strads, the soil, to the Lord Wilton del Gesù. Sharing played a G del Gesù. Uh, Isaac Stern, uh, Pinka Sukaman, my teacher, Itzak plays a Strad. So, so basically, a lot of Incredible violinist Paganini, best example. And I do have to admit that there's a huge fascination when it comes to sound uh, with Del Gesù. And um, it's definitely something at some point in my life, which I, I want to, um, you know, uh, I want to get to know. So uh, I love my strat, strat dearly. Um, at some point, Playing a Del Gesù here and there in, in, in London when I go to Charles Barris or to Tim Inglis or whoever, uh, Jason Price, I, I love going to the shops. You know, for me, this is like shopping for candy. I don't have the <laughs> money to buy the candy, to be quite honest, but I get a little taste by playing. And so at some point, a, a nice Guarneri Del Gesù is definitely a, a big dream, of course. So, David, let me ask you, if you yeah. go into a shop, do, do, do all yeah. the major, what, the shops you go into, they know who you are or not? Yeah, I, I guess sometimes they put a little bit of bigger price tag on just before I but enter the room. But I mean, do you have you ever had the experience of like going in and 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 you say, oh, that looks like a wonderful violin. And they say, oh, do you play the violin? Well, I used to play the violin. Have you ever have you ever sort of smoked somebody? Have you ever caught them off guard? Um, I actually sometimes do it in, in New York when there's a violin player on the street, and I'm not necessarily wearing you know the hair like this, but I wear a cap or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, let me see the fiddle, you know, and then. You mind if I play a few notes? Yeah. So usually I, I I do play something nice, and they're like, "Hey, you must be professional." I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> okay, here's another nice question. If Guanyo, I think I'm saying the yeah. name right. Yeah. If you could have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with any deceased artist, musician, writer, poet, or scientist, who would that be? Oh, probably Mozart just because the letters he wrote are so much fun and they're so like full of v vulgarity actually sometimes, I think he would have been a great person to uh, spend a night with because he, he did like his, his wine, he did like his women and he was quite a fun character. And on top of that, he's an absolute genius with the amount, not even talking about the amount of work he did in, in his short life, but also the, the quality and, and the advances. In, in, in musicality. So Mozart it would be. Okay, here's a question. I, I'm going to read it because, and I don't even know what she's talking about. What is the meaning of the human skull motive for you? It's fashion or philosophy or an approach to life. So please enlighten us, first of all, what the heck is the human <laughs> skull motive? I don't know. I, I, I usually wear like a skull ring on this hand or the, the left hand is, is left pure because I have to play, but on the right bow hand. And I used to joke, you know, because Perlman was always telling, you know, the bow arm, you need to have a strong bow arm. And I was like, when I went with the ring into uh, Perlman's classes, he was like, why are you wearing a ring? I said, it makes my arm heavier, you know, <laughs> I can dig into the strings or no, uh, but it, it was a fashion statement. You know, for me, it's, you know, I don't, I don't uh, mind having something on, on, on that finger. It It's not, a deep philosophical thing that yes i could start saying you know death is part of life and and which it is but in this case it's just a fashion statement well if it makes you feel any better my co-host pinu his sweater is also skull motive i just realized that so i'm but not by the way pinu is the, the the kindest dog ever i i see him always in the background but he's so quiet lovely dog 
he just wants to be there. He just he's just he's got no questions. He's just hanging, you know, he just you know he's but he's hanging beautifully back there. <laughs> he's a he's a sweetheart. We're we're kind yes. of using the pot here. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. Some a lot of people want to know whether you're gonna start recording or when the next recording is for Notre Gramophone. Yes. Um I'm gonna go into the studio in uh beginning of April and probably gonna start um, arranging a couple of pieces before that um, and then I'm going to start trying uh, out some pieces it's I don't want to tell too much about it but um, <laughs> it's going to be a cork classical record uh, okay. which I'm super excited about it's been uh, I think almost three years since I released the last one and so for me it's a big challenge to uh, to put something in, and also a big privilege Dodger gramophone is a major label maybe the biggest when it comes to classical. And I started with Dodger Grammar from when I was 13 years old. So so for me, it's it's a it's a beautiful thing to um, be recording for them again. Uh, but repertoire, uh, I, I still want to kind of like keep it for myself, and, uh, but it's going to be beautiful and hopefully, hopefully people will enjoy it. I'm sure. Look, I'm seeing a lot of questions. I'll play some more here, but, yeah. but I can see people, you know, you in, in Spain, in yeah. Egypt, in Istanbul, in Georgia, in Korea, in Poland. When are you coming back? When it's possible. Yeah. Trust me, I have my suitcase packed in the corner. My violin is next to me. The moments airlines and, and restrictions with quarantine are, are possible to tour or possible to, to enter and, and play. You know, the problem with you, you will be able to travel somewhere. Yes. Right. And with a uh, negative uh, test and stuff. But the problem is I travel over there by myself. Even if I play a solo thing, I have to stick around in most countries for two weeks or 10 days at least. And then wait another 10 days or travel to another place, wait 10 days. I mean, there was, would be a wonderful way to do a, a long vacation with occasional concerts. But for me, and when it comes to touring and when it also comes to, you know, taking a pianist on, on, on tour, I, I cannot do that right now. And of course, there are no possibilities to play anywhere. Nice. So the moment there are small concerts halls available, you know, I, I'll, I'll I, trust me in the first well, one who's, you, who's going to travel. <laughs> you, you still go on on tours with with a pianist and do classical solo violin repertoire and in Suntory Hall or, or Carnegie yeah. or whatever? Yeah, yeah that's it. And then you have these enormous, because something like yeah. this Verona concert, this is an enormous logistical apparatus. Was that only yeah. in Verona or was it, it was part of a tour, wasn't it? It was part of the tour every night, that same apparatus. Yes. Every night, somewhere every else. Every night, yes, every night. Uh, oh my God! It's, it's quite a. It's quite a. We have like six, seven, eight trucks. We travel with with that overnight to the next city, and, and I mean, I don't have to pick everything out of the truck and place it. Obviously, I just pick up my violin off the concert. But it it really is a huge team who's, who's preparing everything overnight and and. You know, those are actually the people who are actually most um, suffering right now because yeah. you know they 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 live from that Absolutely. touring life. I we we are lucky enough to have had our career, have had our uh, you know possibilities to to settle down and 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 you know we do music because we love doing it, not necessarily because we we have to pay the next you know, check on, on the restaurant, which is not open here either. But um, so I, I think in yeah. the end, we, as a musician uh, in my, in our situation, it's it's always good to to be very humble. And, and this year and a half, yes, it's it's not, it's not the most exciting year, but it's it's also, um, I, I really start, started or in the beginning of this pandemic, started thinking about all the people who actually are working for me for the first time and when i tour sometimes there's 60 70 people who work for me who don't actually get to work at all right now and that's it's it's very troubling and that's why i really hope the the sooner people hopefully will get a vaccine and and the, the sooner these people will be able to to make a living again and earn a living it's, it's very tragical actually right now very well said. There's a there's a question about repertoire here, and and yeah. will David, <laughs> yeah, will you release Probably. any more of your sheet music? What does that mean? 
Um, I got in inspired a little bit by... A question. Somebody else, do you also intend to compose classical music such as arias or symphonies and so forth and so on? So tell us about your composing. I am actually writing a little piano concerto right now. <laughs> I love it. I don't, you know, I, I, if I I try to, to use this time to do do things. I, I mean, I write a lot of pop music as well and, and, and R&B and, and sometimes even Deep House. I, I like writing with with the laptop and with my keyboard and but right now i got a little bit inspired by um i you know i like buying old um, vinyl and i have this beautiful record player and um there's a store quite near me which i never never knew existed and i started buying all this rubenstein records because he had this whole collection from this old label a uh, lady actually who, who sold it to him so I bought this whole collection, put it in my place and started listening to it. And it got so inspired. I said, why? Listen, you write so, so many pieces for the violin, sometimes this, sometimes that. Uh, why not write for, for different, in, different instruments? So I, I just finished the second movement. I'm halfway through the third. Wow. Of course, I, I kept the first. First movement is the biggest challenge, of course. I mean, that's, that's the big baby. So I started with the second, which is finished, halfway through the third hopefully going to be finished by the end of the month. And, and then I give it a try at the first movement. So, so little project. Elena, maybe this is the last question. And there's so yeah. many, a lot, hopefully, hopefully people, if you sent your questions yeah. in, David has answered so many yeah. of your various aspects of the questions. What is it more like when you compose your own melody song, for example, Serenity, uh, yeah. you spend some time every day improvising and then collect yeah. most interesting pieces or you wake up in the morning and this is the already did the piece. Uh, how, how does a song start basically um there, there are two ways um sometimes you just have a melody in your head and here's the tricky part sometimes you have a great melody in your head and two minutes later you realize that, that actually is from beethoven that's <laughs> that's uh, the bad situation but sometimes you have a great melody and then you try to search is it somewhere and it's not. And that's the moment you sit on the piano and harmonize the melody and write it. So, but actually, to be quite honest, listening to so much classical music, it does happen a lot that you think you have something great. Ten minutes into arranging the thing, you're like, ah, there was Brahms. Damn it. Okay. Throw this away. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Right. I've got another question for you. This is this is this is a this is a real trivia question. I, I read, read this. Thing. Like you were you were the Guinness Book of Records holder for the fastest. I mean, it's the Hummel Concerto thing. And, no, no, and, the, the side of the bundle. Dude. 2010. Who who dethroned you? And, and until now, to be quite honest, nobody, because the person who actually theoretically said he played it fast and didn't play it on an acoustic violin and anybody who knows a little bit about music uh, or about the instrument is when you play an acoustic violin it's a different kind of bow stroke and a different kind of playing than when you do and he did actually play it on an electric violin and that is i could play it much faster on the electric either because there's no you don't have to have produce the sounds right, right. so nobody so far <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got to be That's honest. <laughs> oh my goodness! Look, I, I, we're, we're right at one hour. We promised to be one yeah. hour, and we are one hour. What a wonderful conversation! Everybody, please go check out this concert, the live from Verona, uh, and and wherever else you are, David. You're you're a. It's it's great to meet you. It's just great to Absolutely. meet. Absolutely. I I hope at some point when this whole thing is over, we get to meet in person, yeah. and I'll. Uh, we will be able to shake hands. If you if you get a song going that you want to hear somebody sing it so that you can make it violin, let me know. Absolutely, I will. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much for your time. And uh, to every to everybody to everybody out there, stay safe, and I hope to see you all very very soon. That goes for me as well. See you next week. Bye bye.